All right, so we're here to talk about response to WordPress theming. Uh, you know, initially when I started giving this talk, I was giving uh, specific examples of how to use media queries and JavaScript and all this other stuff to kind of manipulate your, uh, your themes so that they are more responsive. But then something that kind of dawned on me was that uh, it's all the same. Like at the end of the day, we're just creating HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and uh, whether it's powered by WordPress or not, it's all the same stuff. So the question was, what are we doing that's different with WordPress or the CMS? powered website that's different than the static website. So before we jump in, uh, this is me and this is my shameless plug. Uh, I just finished the book. It took over my life, so now I want people to buy it. Um, if you go to Amazon and you go to buy it, you get to, like today, you get to sit and wait patiently for like two months because it's not actually out yet. Uh, but, you know, have at it. I'm also at Professor on Twitter. And that's, yes, that's, that's, yes, that's really my handle. Um, all right, so like I said, what's the difference between responsive on WordPress and responsive if you were just doing a typical static website? Well, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, that's all pretty much the same. Um, you know, you're going to have different elements that are going to be different. You're probably going to have like hardcoded links straight to your CSS files that are relevant to links. You're going to have a lot more classes like the body class, the post class, stuff like that. But it's all manipulable by you. You can do all that stuff however you want to do it. So, you know, we look at the markup at the end of the day. When you view source in your browser, you're looking at a static website, you're looking at WordPress. Other than the cues to that it's WordPress, the markup and all that stuff is the same. And then, I like Fire. I think he knows cool stuff. So it doesn't have to go Fire in presentation. So frameworks, <coughs> systems, all that stuff, it all still works. I get this question all the time from my students or when I'm uh, giving talks, you're like, well, how does you know, Twitter bootstrap work and all this other stuff? Well, it's, it's JavaScript. You can you still use JavaScript, and you can still use grid systems, you can still use all that stuff. It doesn't change. Um, the big difference is the user admin, right? So when you create a static website and you're handing it off to somebody who has no idea how to use HTML or CSS, and you just you give it to them and you say, hey, here it is, it's done. But with WordPress, you hand it to them, and then all of a sudden they have this beautiful UI where they can go in and they can edit things and add things and put in static images with hard-coded widgets on them. It breaks all your responsive stuff. So that's the big deal. So for user admin, it's a person who's running or operating the system, or in other words, the person's going to gap up your design. <laughs> and it's not their fault, right? Because WordPress is great. We've done a really good job of making it easy for people to go in there and add content and do the things that they want to do. Uh, if there's any blog writers in here who don't know any HTML and they break stuff all the time, I'm sorry. But it's true. I mean, if you guys don't have that HTML, CSS background, uh, and so things go in there and things happen and you forget to close the tag or something, I don't know, and you break stuff. Um, but, you know, work, um, and, and this is a comparison I make to, to user admins uh, with new websites. It's like a the little kid who opens up the Nintendo uh, system on Christmas and goes berserk. They're like, oh, this is awesome. You guys designed the greatest website ever. And it's powered by WordPress, which apparently is so cool. Because you tell me it is. And now I'm going to go in there and I'm going to edit stuff. And then I get lost. And I stick my head in the box and I walk around the room like an idiot. You know, you got to provide that training, right? But there's some point where you can't provide enough training because you're not going to teach them how to do, how to write markup or how to do other things. So you have to kind of give them the tools to empower them to do things right. So WordPress as a whole is so easy that a gay man can do it. Again, you run into issues where even this guy can break them. So they're going to have some roadblocks, right? Uh, showing and hiding content based on the user device. So uh, Chris gave a great talk yesterday about uh, designing for mobile. And in many cases, there are times when we want to create alternative content for a mobile device or maybe switch it around, change the way it's laid out. Uh, you know, you may not want to show the full size infographic that you have on a mobile device. Instead, you might want to provide them with a link to it. But how do we how do we give that option to a user admin? That's hard. Uh, media and maintaining a fluid layout. So one issue that we continue to run into is that a user admin who doesn't know HTML, they upload an image, they insert it into the post, and what happens? You get those hard coded width and height attributes right into the image, right? And so, like, if your site's expanding and contracting. Uh, having multiple columns in a single content area, that's tough. 
because you have a single content window to put all that content into it. If you want some stuff on the left-hand column, some stuff on the right-hand column, how do you do that? How do you differentiate from what belongs on the left and what belongs on the right, and then what happens when you construct that, that website? And then menus. Uh, you know, I get a lot of flack for telling people that they should have different navigations for mobile devices, but I think it's important. You know, we talked about the restaurant themes uh, yesterday, Chris's talk, and how, you know, restaurant, if, if you're looking at a restaurant website on your phone, you really don't want to know, like, who's running the joint. You want to know what their hours are, maybe some menu items, and that's it, right? So instead of providing them with seven or eight links at the top of the header of the mobile site, you provide them with directions and menu. And then you drop all that navigation down to the bottom. Again, easy for us if we know how to code, but how does the user admin take control of that? So the first thing I want to get into is featured images. I love featured images because I think it gives us the most control over our media, um, especially if you want to upload pictures of fast worlds that love WordPress. <laughs> Um, so, you know, what you can do is you can go into your functions file and you can add image sizes. A lot of people uh, may or may not know this. Just gauge the room real quick. How many people in here have written, like, their own functions in a functions.php file? Okay. How many people have, uh, like, altered a loop or tore it up and moved it around and stuff like that? Okay, so for the most part, everybody in here is coding at least a little bit, right? Yeah? Okay. So if, you, if you're not, we can talk afterwards and I can help you walk through all this stuff. Uh, but what I'm doing here is I'm just adding image sizes with name and width and height and whether or not to do hard or soft cropping. And what happens here is that now because I've done this, when a user adds a image to the, uh, the admin, they upload an image, it'll automatically resize the image to those sizes and, call it, and give it a name uh, that we can call later. So what this allows us to do then is to put those images in a specific spot, maybe in a specific column. We could do things like uh, uh, giving you a specific class so that when uh, you, know, you can use JavaScript to remove an element, like the, uh, the width and height attributes, you can do a lot of stuff like that. Um, so once you put it in, you know, the issue that you're going to oh, sorry. I'm going to talk about how we can um, manipulate this too and show different featured images. If you look, we have a uh, slider, small slider, but these are all the same ratio. So what we can do then is decide which ones go where and which ones are served up at certain times. And I'll show you how to do that in a few slides. Uh, but this is a big step for us uh, in trying to maintain our, our uh, mobile integrity. Uh, the next thing is multi-column. Uh, um, this is my website, and what I have is I have a column here, and then I have this right-hand column here. Um, and then if you expand the browser enough, you get into three columns, right? So the comments that are down here get pulled up, and they're brought over here up to the right. The other thing that I have, and I think uh, that slide got dropped, unfortunately, is that I have a notes section that lives right here. So you guys know how when you read a book, you see on the left-hand column, you'll see like a notes section that says something like, uh, you know, uh, here's a tip, or here's a URL to go to a certain spot. What I had done, let me just skip ahead and make sure I see yeah. Sorry, I got dumb. But what I had done was I, I created a short code that would basically close the div and then open up a left-hand column div so you drop stuff in, and then the uh, it would then reclose this div and close, uh, reopen this div. So what happened was is in your content, you could wrap a note in a short code. Everybody in here knows what a short code is? Yeah. So then what happens is that short code automatically pulls that data out of that column and puts it over here onto the left. And I'm so sorry that it didn't get into the slide. I don't know why it didn't, but I'll, when I put these slides up later, I'll make sure to drop it in there so you guys can see how I did it. Uh, but you know, it, it was a quick little shortcut function. I knew exactly how to close this div, how to open this one and reclose it. So now anytime that you went into the content area and a user admin wanted to pull something out and put it into the left-hand column, all they had to do was wrap it in a short code. And then if you want to, you can get into the editor wrap content, highlight it, and just select what short code you want to wrap around it. And then that makes it really easy. So then you can provide a very small amount of training to your admins and give them the ability to rip that content out and do whatever they, they want with it and give them more control over it. Uh, so, so as you know, the site expands, you know, responsive is not just mobile. So we have to make sure that we're going as far as we can. 
and taking advantage of as much of the site as possible. Uh, does anybody in here know Arnold Balkin? He's a UI UX uh, genius. He started doing this a while back. I love it. The fact that he puts his comments parallel with the, the content, it, it creates so much more of a social aspect to me. You're able to read the content and also see what people are talking about at the same time. So we know that blog readers or just news readers or anybody online now, like they're used to skimming, right? They just kind of skim through, they find the parts that they're looking for, you guys help them out with header tags, and just kind of give them an idea of what they're about to read in that paragraph, so that way they can just screen through and read the parts that they want to. Well, it's nice, because now what we can do is we can have our comments alongside the content and make it even more accessible to them to grab and read more if they want to. Um, and then this all just condenses too, so that's going to be the mobile version, too, so you can just see how it knits, so we're not really losing anything. Um, but then, you know, the thing that you can do is, like on a home page, where it's a little bit more uh, a dynamic layout, you can start to add things. So you might not have comments to put over there, but you can do things like little um, secret Easter eggs if you wanted to. So I have this robot that comes out on mine if you spread it out hard, you know, wide enough. And then it starts to talk to This is for like uh, my crew. I just we just got 27 inch IMAX at the office. And we have that huge <laughs> Yeah, just keep going and going and going. So does that actually add value to the site? You might argue that that's something that would definitely not need to be in a mobile site for two reasons. One, because obviously it wouldn't work on a mobile site, and two, it doesn't actually add any real value to the site. But what it does is it adds a little bit of comedy, right? So like you arrive at that site and you're going you full width, it adds a little bit of fun. I have some really weird stuff on my site, I know. <laughs> Alright, so the next thing I want to talk about are menus. Um, so we talked a little bit about the benefit of having different menus, one for mobile and one for desktop. Now, I'm not for, this is just a philosophy kind of Part. Whether or not you want to have full menus on your mobile app or not, I mean, you might be creating a responsive site for a company that's got 80 pages on it, and there's no need to have 80 links in a mobile site. You would just drive the person nuts. Uh, but I, what I am for, absolutely, is rearranging your content so that people can get stuff faster, right? I don't want to come to a site and have to scroll on my phone for five minutes to get the part that I want to. So you can start to gauge what people are going to on, their, on your mobile devices and try and make it easier for them. Look at analytics, see what they're doing. And if you notice that if you're running a, a restaurant website or, or whatever it may be, and, and they're really just actively looking for the contact page, the directions page, and there's some information about your company or what you're doing, put those links at the top, right? And then have a second sub-nav somewhere else. Maybe you can create a way to hide it and have it come out. You can have like a little read more button, you click it, and then all your nav shows, stuff like that. But how do we do that? How do we give that power to the user admin? That's not exactly an easy thing to do. So what I did was I create, excuse the typo right here, um, I created a, a menu, a mobile header menu location, and a desktop header menu location. And what we can do is give the users a little bit of training, teach them how to make a menu, they can create their menus however they want, drag and drop them however they want. If your theme, your mobile theme supports children, then you can just, you know, create sub-items, things like that. And then just tell them that you know you create one small navigation for the mobile, and then you have a main one here for the desktop. And I'm going to show you in two seconds how you can switch between these menus um, based off whether you're a mobile or, or not. But this is just one way to think about creating more empowerment for your user app. So we got to remember the content is king, kind of the same thing we're talking about. So everything that I kind of talked about was ways to empower them to fix this stuff, but now you've got to actually go into the themes and make sure it actually works, right? So on a mobile device, uh, wouldn't it be great on a server level, so you're never relying on client side, you're using this for laying out or anything like that, that you could say, on a mobile device, do this. Else, do other this, whatever else that is. Right. So what we're going to do, a new um, function that's released, I think it's 3.4, uh, is WP is mobile, which used to be like WP is iPhone, I think. Um, and so you can write a simple thing that says, basically, we talked about this earlier, if it's on a mobile, serve up one featured image, and if it's not, serve up a larger featured image. And that makes your life a little bit easier. And then you can do the same thing with menus. So you can choose which menu to show, depending on whether or not they're on a mobile device or not. 
Um, but we can take it a step farther. What if you are at the server level able to say something like, is, is iPhone, is Blackberry, is HTTP, is Snap and Shell, da 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 da. Is iPad, is Kindle, Blackberry tablet, I don't know who has one of these. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Does anybody know what that is? Does anybody have one? <laughs> Things like is iPad, is Kindle, um, is iOS versus is Android. These types of things would really help us, right? Because then we can start to modify the content, alter what we're doing in different places. Uh, you know, you can make assumptions that obviously an iPad template, or, or at a certain point, iPads would probably be mostly retina display, not right now, but in the, in the future, that would be the case. So things like that would really help you. So how do you actually do that? Well, I found this script to this class. Uh, Thinking about his name, um, he's created some Google, and you'll have a link at the end of this called HP Mobile Detect, and uh, it gives us the this exact ability. We can then put this class into our WordPress uh, and start asking these questions. Now this is all kind of like junk, just so I can throw it in here. But then you can ask questions like, is iPhone, is mobile, is tablet, else do this. And we can extrapolate this beyond just images. We can do this for the menus. We can do this for specific elements of content. We can do this for advertisements. All those things that are really difficult to display in your mobile sites, we can now take greater control over using this. And all it is is a matter of grabbing this class and just throwing it into your theme. I'm actually working on a plugin for this. I didn't get it done, but that will be up soon. But then, you know, once you have that built and you have it into your functions, you can start writing your own short codes. So if you want something like this, you can create a short code. And you can uh, ask if it's mobile. So, if it's, uh, so this short code then can be wrapped around something that would be for uh, non-mobile users, right? For desktop only. So there are instances, and I know that a lot of you uh, writers out there and mobile first guys might want to shoot me uh, for saying this, but there are plenty of times, at least in my experience, when there is content that just does not belong on a mobile device. If I have a 3,000 pixel high by 1,500 pixel high infographic, my mobile user's going to hate me for trying to download that inadvertently, right? They're going to come to your site. They don't know what they're getting into. They don't know that you had an infographic on that site. Now, all of a sudden, it's not loading. They're just going to go back. So we can take it a step further, add another one for only mobile. There we go. So only mobile, which is then basically asking the same thing. You could probably write this in a better way if you wanted to, but this is going to fly. So now what we can do is alter this so we can say, uh, give them the infographic, the actual infographic, if they're on a desktop or non-mobile device. If they're on the only mobile, what we can do is provide them with a link to the infographic and then tell them to download it. So what this does, now you're still giving the same content to the person, but using the term infographic here is probably going to work to me as a mobile user. This is a huge file. You can obviously write anything you want in here. You can write, download the huge ass file that I put up here. <laughs> so whatever you want to do is fine. Uh, but the point here is that you're giving them the option. You're not presenting it to them and throwing it in their mobile device and making it difficult for them and making their life miserable. You're just sitting at the Starbucks trying to order a coffee, right? So, what does it all mean? It means less HTTP requests, no need for display none. People are still doing this all the time, where basically they'll just hide something completely. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're not downloading that image. So you could have a huge image on your home page, and uh, for your mobile device, you're all proud of yourself if you wrote our media query and did display none on the featured image on the home page. And that's great, now it looks awesome, but you're still downloading that image. And I think sometimes people don't understand that. So when you download that image, you're actually still creating you know, bandwidth issues. You're still relying on the mobile device to actually grab it before it's going to move on, things like that. 
um, you can maintain the same content for everyone. So we talked about that infographic where something like that might have to actually get stripped for a mobile device. Now what we can do is control how we're delivering it to that mobile device and still giving everybody the same content. Um, and remove calls to files that you don't need. You know, one thing that people tend to forget is they create these like awesome <coughs> JavaScript drop-downs and their Nemo sliders and all that stuff. And they're so cool and then you decide not to call that content or you rearrange that content. But did you forget to take that JavaScript call, that file out of the header? So a lot of people tend to do that. So they're still calling the, the Nemo slider functions or the menu down, drop down functions, all that stuff, and they haven't eliminated it. So something like this will give you more empowerment to actually remove that stuff if you don't need it. Obviously, you don't need to download the JavaScript files for a Nemo slider if you're not even going to present it to someone on the board. So remember, it's all about giving control back to the user admin. And questions? I kind of screamed through that a little bit, but the last time I gave this talk, I had like 50 questions and I didn't have enough time, so I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity. Uh, I made you a mistake, but I was in a uh, radar session yesterday where he said that JavaScript and WordPress get stripped out. It's JavaScript, what? It will get stripped out. When? And this is in the shot code. Uh, only dot com. Okay. I, I don't think I'm understanding it, but when you go with your HTML and you program in like a AWeber JavaScript and you go back to visual, it kicks it out and then your AWeber code is gone because of the JavaScript. But if you embed it with a short code, Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So you're saying like you're actually calling a JavaScript file, writing script tags, writing your visual editor, and you're kind of jumping back and forth? Absolutely. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I just put that note and that's why I'm going to I got gotcha. you. Yeah, so if you write the, the short codes are built into the WordPress API, they're made to do that kind of stuff, so you can wrap that content with those short codes, and you won't ever lose them. You can put them in the visual editor or the HTML editor. It won't change anything. Okay. So it'll work either way. Yeah. So when you're writing the short code for the, the page reference, so the, the link or the image, are you asking your client to learn how to write out an image source or do you press a button and it inserts it and it inserts the code as HTML? That's a good question. So the question was um, if you're writing that short code around like an image source tag, to, uh, are you relying on the client to understand that? And the question is, is uh, to, to understand HTML enough to write the HTML tag. No, the, the, that was just a single example. But what you can do is you can give um, the, them the knowledge of how to use a short code and how to op, you know, encapsulate content and just wrap it around anything. And then it can be anything. So if they want to, if they have something else for like an ad or, or whatever it may be, they can just wrap those short codes around literally anything in that content area and it'll deal with it how it needs to deal with it. So the only thing you really need to train your users on, for example, an image, is how to do the typical insert image, insert it into post, and then once that's done, you can do one of two things. You can either just have them manually put a short code around it, or you can put it into the editor. I've seen that a lot. I haven't actually done it myself, but you can grab, you can grab you know, highlight the content, go to the editor, and you'll see the short code waiting for you. You just put it and wrap it around it. Okay, great. Just based on the question, it sounds like some folks aren't clear that Although uh, scripts are stripped out of a normal post per page, that the short code is a mechanism for defining a short code. And then, which is like calling a function on a page, the short code can have parameters, and the, the short code calls the script that then gets rendered as script, yeah. and you can set it up so your, your, your clients, you can show them if you put in this short code and then reference this thing in it, that will embed it, but that's how short codes work. Yeah, so short codes are, give you guys the ability to give your clients the ability to call a function. It can be pretty much anything. It doesn't have to do it the exact way I did it here. You could have a short code. What I give to uh, my team all the time is uh, the ability to call the blog URL into the content, because if you're working on like a local host environment and you're linking hard, hard code links to your other pages, and it says something like HTTP localhost slash, you know, whatever it may be, and then you 
you had to put that on a live site, you didn't have to circulate, you know, you could go through all that content. So what you can do is create a simple like little short code that says like site URL and it just prints the URL right into the content. So short codes can pretty much be anything you want them to be. Um, they're just the ability for someone to call a function. And there's two types of short codes. One that's just a, a regular square bracket short code, and then there's the ones that kind of wrap around content, and then you can filter that content and do something with it. So you can remove it completely. You could um, uh, add content to so it. You could add like span tags around it so that it highlights a certain way. Um, you know, if you're if you're creating a very heavy, heavily designed site and you're doing like special fonts and things like that, you know, you can create short codes to wrap. Uh, like an item with a class so that you can, you know, you can do anything you want with it. Yeah? Are there any performance considerations that are involved in short codes? The short codes? Yeah. Um, I mean, well, it's, it's, all, it's all done before the site's uh, presented to the user. I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Andrew's in the room, I think, right? No? Somebody? So I, I'm wondering when you were uh, talking about uh, serving the infographic to a desktop user but not to a mobile user, how do you treat the tablet users? Is an iPad a mobile device or is it a, a desktop? It really comes down to your exact demographic. I mean, if you have, uh, the question was, is a, is a tablet device really like a mobile device and whether or not you want to give them big stuff? Um, you know, I mean, an iPad can still run on 3G, right? right? So you can still run into bandwidth issues and all that. Uh, it's kind of like a per case basis. You have to decide what makes sense for you and your client and all that. Uh, I'm opposed to putting any huge infographics like that unexpectedly on any device other than a desktop. Uh, the thing is, it's like non-user initiated content. Remember back when we used to play videos without giving clients or users the permission to hit play and just start playing those? Or you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, or like uh, audio that would just start blasting on your, you know, we kind of all got away from that. But now, you know, serving this kind of stuff up on a mobile device is still like non-user initiated stuff. So you're not giving them the chance to choose to download something. So I you don't use MIDI files anymore? What's that? You don't use MIDI files anymore in your pages? <laughs> 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 you know, it's like, it's like the whole thing with the can't write PHP in a content editor. So if you're going to do it in the content editor, no. But if you're going to do it in the theme itself, so if you're going to remove or hide exact specific functionality, yes. Yeah. I think Chris had mentioned in an earlier presentation that was a suggestion about using short codes for non static <coughs> short codes versus puzzle short codes that maybe puzzle short codes would have been a preferable to that and then re-speed something, re-clean something. What, what, how would you respond to that idea? Well, so you're talking about, um, so basically like someone just switched themes and all that functionality disappears? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. So, I mean, it's up to you. If you're a themer, you know, there's some ad advantages to doing stuff like that because then people are kind of hold on to your themes, but that's not really like the WordPress way of doing things. You know, you want to add freedom to choose to do all that stuff. So that's that's why I would suggest making this into a plugin. And it's very easy to do that. And it's something I'm actually, I just haven't had the time to do, but we'll, we'll be getting it done soon. So can you read it? So once it's a plugin, it'll be theme independent. And then oh. you can have seven, you know, you can choose to have seven themes over the next year, and it would all still work just fine. Oh, OK. Uh, for response to that, uh, I, I know there are a lot of ways to do it, but what are your recommendations for, like, embedding stuff? Like, when you embed, like, YouTube or, like, Google Forms, yeah. sometimes yeah. they don't act properly. Yep. When you like build on mobile or when you like in my So what are your recommendations for like embedded? Well you know it's, it's hard because you're uh, the question is how do you um how do you manage things that are being embedded from like third party sites like YouTube or Google Forms and things like that and they're not kind of playing nicely. Um, you know sometimes you can work to figure out a fix for it and then uh, override it with JavaScript. So there was this plugin that I wanted on my site that would add a uh, a social link sharing link, but for some reason they would hard code uh, the iframe width or the iframe on it, and it drove me nuts. So uh, 
I didn't want to hack up the plugin and I didn't have time to do it right, so I just wrote a quick line of JavaScript that stripped out that hard coding and then it, it worked perfectly. So, so it's like a, when you're done with this project and a client all of a sudden wants like a Google Boom embedded, yeah. so how would you recommend dealing with that? Charging the client to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's the, at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure you're serving up the best possible sites you can. And you can't, you can't foresee every single thing. So good planning uh, will help you to understand what they want to do. Um, if Google Form doesn't work, you know, you can look at Gravity Forms or another form solution, maybe that will work. But that's another thing that's kind of a per case basis. Are there um, responsive plugins that you recommend before you write your own? Um, there's a couple out there that I've seen that I haven't actually played with that'll do stuff like stripping the static HTML attributes off of uh, images and things like that. But the problem with that is that I think that you know it's a good solution for a specific instance, but it's not a global solution. Because if you're a user admin and, and you put an image in there and you align it left and you look at it on your desktop and it's 50% of the width and your text comes up alongside of it nicely, and it's 300 pixels wide, and when your column dumps down to 200 pixels, it breaks, you have a plugin that strips out the attributes. Now what? It's not replacing it with like a pixel based, I mean, a percentage based width, so then, then it's not loading correctly anymore either. So I think it's one of those situations where, uh, for that exact instance, it needs to be a better solution. But I haven't seen too many plugins that I've played with that I was like, this is making my life a lot easier. But that's also because I just have looked outside what I'm doing, I guess. What is your opinion about um, drag and drop control panels, which you need to find, like, uh, uh, maybe a uh, page line tab, for example. What I found is they are not responsive. They are really more great, and the client really understands how the drag and drop change different sections of the website. But whenever they try to make it really responsive, it becomes so complicated that the whole interface and clients have got lost. So, yeah. your, um, so I don't have a lot of experience with like drag and drop content elements like that. Um, but at the end of the day, do you still have control of how the HTML is output? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you need to take control of it from that point. Of view. So it may not necessarily. I don't know how it would work for you when you're dragging content. In, so basically, you're dragging like whole content blocks into an area. Well, yeah. Basically, it's a short post, but they are uh, presented in a visual way, more okay. appearing. You know, like if you want to put the testimonial on the page, you just provide the testimonial and drag it and drag it on. Yeah. yeah. So, but if you have control over the way the testimonial markup is graded in the end, then you can take control of how it will be responsive. So as long as you have control of the output, then you're fine. <coughs> Are you dealing with uh, the drag and drop section of it being responsive? So like while they're actually dragging, you worry about being responsive? Yeah, the problem is when you deal with the desktop on the version. Yeah. Is, you know, you do find the layout like two columns or three columns. You can drag and drop basically all the clients can create as many pages as they wish. It's sort of a side builder inside the work. Yeah, I guess that. Whenever they want to, to make it responsive, you know, because you, you, you never know what, what kind of resolution there would be on mobile side. Just break stuff, you know. And right. page lines did a great effort to try to, you know, to maintain that, but it's just, you know. It's but you're not dealing with people on the phone trying to add those testimonials, right? They're only doing it on yeah. that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So again, it's it's all about the output, and if you can control it, then you can do whatever you need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does PHP mobile text that you show, yep. is the breakpoint for that being defined in your? Yes, that's the media queries. Nope. So, it's all, so the question was, is the PHP mobile detect where are the breakpoints? There actually there are no breakpoints. Uh, what it's doing is it's uh, pulling the server to decide what kind of, uh, if you're on a mobile device, if you're on a certain operating system, things like that. And uh, it's just a PHP class that you can actually just click right into your functions.php file. And it's pre client uh, side. So it's all while the server is just communicating back and forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just wondering how it's... It's, it's not deciding, deciding anything based off of resolution or okay. size. It's only deciding based on is an iPhone or right. is, it, like, is a desktop. So you ask those traditional questions. Right. So you're not asking, like, is on a desktop and less than 600 pictures wide. That you still control in your CSS or however you want to do it. Yeah. I got like four minutes, so we have a couple more questions or we can wrap up. I just have one question. And that was, it looks like with those scripts, uh, the, the PHP functions, it's doing browser detection. 
And I've always been trained to not do browser sniffing, but instead to actually determine what the capabilities of the browser that's visiting me. Uh, like, can I do rounded corners? Can I do opacity versus mm -hmm. alpha layer? Is this a movement back to browser sniffing? Well, it's using the server array to decide. decide. There is the option for uh, iOS, the, um, the browser type, all that stuff. So it's not a movement back to that, but there are cases where you just need to know flat out, are they on a mobile device or are they not? So it's not about capabilities, because you know, when you're serving up an infographic or not, you're not deciding, you're not running like tests about their bandwidth and see how much they can download or whether or not they want to decide to have that or not. You're just deciding whether or not you want to give that to a mobile person or not. And in an instance like that, I just prefer to give them the option to download it. So it's not so much about like moving towards back towards browser sniffing versus capability. It's just it's trying to provide solutions to the user address so that they can take more control over their content. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. That's it. All right, so if you guys have any other questions, I'm doing the happiness bar. I think it's four today. You can hit me up there or on Twitter, wherever. Thank you. Show the URL.